You think it's funny to take screenshots of people's NFTs, huh? Property theft is a joke to you. I'll have you know that the blockchain doesn't lie. I own it. Even if you save it, it's my property. You are mad that you don't own the art that I own. Delete that screenshot. All right, folks. Yeah. Probably, you probably think it's funny. Episode 44 <laughs> of Left Reckoning. Uh, we're right clicking our way to equality. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I do like it. They've made it easy for us, right? Being a modern day Robin Hood's a lot easier than it was back a few hundred years ago. Exactly. If only Robin Hood could right click. Uh, I was cracking up trying to imagine explaining NFTs to Michael because I feel like it would have been one of those super internet concepts <laughs> that he just was not going to be able to, to wrestle with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I thought about going back and talking to. Um, I think we had David Columbia on TMBS back in the day. Just go revisit what the, mm -hmm. the in the early era of the well, I could say the mid era actually of this madness. Anyway, um, not not only a, not a crypto show today. We're talking with Paul Bowers about South Carolina, mm -hmm. uh, David's old haunt, my uh, second home, man. I'm really looking forward to that. Talking about some BMWs and stuff like that, uh, um, among other things. I'm uh, intrigued to talk about, uh, and we'll also be talking about. Uh, failures of uh, of climate negotiations, embarrassments. Twenty six. I mean, just window dressing, frankly, and sort of how we can push through. I, I'm sorry. I I understand the feeling that a lot of folks have these days about how we have to push, obviously, through right wing propaganda and through the oil lobby. But boy, oh boy, uh, when you're seeing the, the interference that just kind of everyday typical Democratic Party leaders um, are are running, the interference that they're running. Um, I mean, we we have a formidable job ahead of us, and we need to be sort of prepared to push back against that. We have some really great Abby Martin clip uh, confronting Pelosi and a few other folks. Folks, um, some really unfortunately vile clips from Barack Obama, sort of dis dismissing climate activists, um, and, and a few other things. I mean, these are important conversations. And a little bit after that, too, um, we're going to be talking briefly, but it's an important topic about the only call on uh, Nicaragua. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Plus, a hell of a lot more um, in the post game. Matt's got some Stephen Jay Gould um, comparing yeah, that. You know, to, yeah, we talk an awful lot about bum steers here. We're going to give you a golden steer. Uh, in, <laughs> and actually, I don't know if the parable of the golden calf, I don't, I need to like maybe yeah, do some it works well enough, I'm sure. Anyway, um, an absolute stone cold lock as far as like a book recommendation. In, we're going to be dunking on Ben Shapiro, who's uh, got the calipers out. He's breaking mm -hmm. up the calipers. You see uh, CRT get the slightest validation in a, a, a elections. And the calibers come out. We're starting to do race science again, folks. So we're going to return back to 1981 when this was all debunked back then in a way that is, has never been answered. And, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Plus, much, much more. We'll be taking your questions. Um, but, yeah. Before I mean, before we get to all that, though, I mean, there's some things that we need to talk about. First of all, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, we have in the description some strike funds that you can donate to. This is a critical moment. I know this is a difficult time for the left and we're sort of looking for our direction. Um, but there are some things that are abundantly clear that we can be doing um, that, that will help out our movement immediately. And the first thing that you can do is work as hard as you can to want to expand the labor movement and to support ongoing labor mobilization. You know, I don't feel like scoring cheap points on people, right? But there's all this talk from folks about, you know, the general strike. We're going to have a general strike. We're going to have a general strike. We need to be able to build the capacity to sustain the strikes that are ongoing right now um, before we can talk about big stuff like that, right? So this yeah. is something that's important to you. Please, you know, take a couple of moments and give people five, ten dollars uh, to make sure that people can continue taking the fight uh, to the bosses. There's a couple of things that we want to highlight. Um, just the first things first is the fact that this strike in Alabama, the UN UMWA strike, a warrior Matt Cole has been going on for eight months. Throughout this period of time, these striking coal miners 
have been faced with brutal repression tactics from the company. Um, remember, for people who have not been following this story, I'll give you the quickest version possible. Um, this, this mine in Alabama went to the workers and essentially said, we're not as profitable as we used to be. We need to make some cuts to make sure that we can get through a difficult time. The workers agreed to take temporary pay cuts to make sure that the operation continued. The company that owned the mine at that period of time went bankrupt. And then a bunch of capital, primarily BlackRock, came in and bought out the mines. Now that mine is not only profitable, it is exceeding any kind of reasonable expectation for profit. While those workers continue to, continue to work for that you know, low pay that they sort of negotiated as a temporary sacrifice to make sure that the operation did not shut down. The miners have come back and demanded higher pay, and BlackRock and the rest of ca the capital refuse. Again, despite the fact that they have been more profitable than they ev this mine has ever been in its history, right? And this strike has been going on for eight months. Um, these miners have faced not only the difficulty of being on strike for eight months, people have been hit by trucks on the picket line. People have been harassed in their homes. And there have been a lot of other allegations um, that have not been proven nor disproven um, about other kind of more sinister abuse to these folks. Um, this is continuing. This is a really crucial fight. And just this week, um, the guys from Alabama went up again to New York City in an action that I love so much, taking the fight directly to the people who own stake and capital in this mine. They took the fight to Manhattan um, and, they, and they protested outside the Black Rock building in protest of another legal decision against them to make it so that they cannot pick it. Um, I believe it's somewhere uh, near, they have to be three football fields away um, from the entrance to the mine, which is ridiculous. It completely goes against the entire idea of a picket. And all these people want to say, like, well, they can challenge it. They can challenge it. The point is to delay yeah. and to create speed bumps, right? We, we've um, seen this before, right? right? With the John Deere stuff. It's you, you can find yeah. them into um, pointlessness and then uh, let them challenge it until the energy is sapped up. So 500 of, of the miners went up to New York and they picketed outside of BlackRock. Um, so if they thought that they were too close to the operations before, uh, I think it's even better to take it even closer and taking it right to the heart of capital there. Um, but five people, including the president of the UMWA, um, were arrested. Um, so this is a really great time to show your support financially for, to the strike fund, uh, which, again, you can find below. Um, this, I don't know. This is a crucial labor fight. And this is the kind of thing, if you care about this stuff, if you think that labor and working class power is to answer, these are the moments to really start showing up. Yeah, I totally agree. I think like the um, in a certain way, I like that people get involved in election campaigns and stuff like this. But I think mm -hmm. if you have a dollars to give. They're going to go a lot farther, I think, here than any kind of politician, honestly. <laughs> you know, for, they truly are. Um, and the solidarity operation that we have seen um, in Alabama has been really beautiful. The community has really shown up um, for these workers. And just giving that kind of financial support um, from you know outside of the state and from across the country really helps that kind of solidarity effort sort of blossom uh, as well. Yep. But there's another, I mean, there's another really exciting uh, operation when it comes to unions um, in Buffalo, New York. Yeah. So um, Starbucks workers, I think about four, uh, maybe I don't <laughs> numbers, I don't want to say, but um, Starbucks workers are trying to uh, um, unionize here. Um, we've got this yeah, article. Around three different stores, I believe. Yeah. We have this article in Gawker. Um, um, an attempt to uh, connect with workers who are facing a union vote at three locations in and around Buffalo, New York. Howard Schultz, the company's largest individual shareholder, former executive, and someone who, like me, decided not to run for... Okay, that's the editorial from the Gawker. I reportedly shared a story. So, look, I, um, I, I'm interested in wisdom. Um, this is... Uh, this is interesting, right? You, mm -hmm. This is not normally what you hear when it comes to, uh, to like, um, you shouldn't do a union, like, listen to this Holocaust parable. <laughs> so in the, in, out of novelty alone, I think you have to lend this billionaire your ear. Um, mm -hmm. So he says uh, uh, this. This is Many Howard Schultz. This is Howard Schultz. Uh, yeah. Uh, owner of, uh, of Starbucks. Former Many presidential years, candidate. Yes, exactly. Like uh, I forget what his, what was he? What, what was his main thing about? 
just that you know the country's sort of out of uh out, you know we've lost our civility and we need to return to big dreamers like him i mean i think yeah. his whole thing was actually that he grew up in public housing um that's York, right but like really exactly. nice public housing which is a great right. thing um, exactly he's an example yeah, yeah exactly uh i mean it shouldn't be that nice to where you can be a billionaire which is why howard schultz <laughs> had a, a very big part of his platform when he ran for president was a huge investment in public housing just for people who don't know he did not include that, that is not true, yes. his... <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh let's just fast forward to here um so imagine this you like come into unionize and the boss comes in and tells you this story he says uh Many years ago, I took a trip to Israel and I met this very wise, pious, religious man. He taught me many lessons, not about religion, but about life, morality, and honor. I will tell you two stories. I think we're only going to hear one. Uh, two experience I had with him. I hope it resonates with you. I'm Jewish, but this is not about being Jewish. Not at all. It's about humanity. Okay, sure. Um, I, I, I don't know if that's about... It's about inhumanity, I think. <laughs> um, anyway, the first story is, he says... Uh, to me that when people in Germany and Poland were sent to the concentration camps, they were thrown into rail cars and sometimes the journey was eight hours, 10 hours, 15 hours, no light, no water, no food. When they arrived at the camps, the rail cars were slammed open. You could hear that metal door just right against the cold weather. I mean, really getting poetic here. Men were separated from will women and women were separated from children and one person for every six was given a blanket. One blanket for every six people and the person who got the blanket had to decide what to do with this blanket that I had for myself. And not everyone, but most people, most people shared their blanket with five other people. And the rabbi says to me, take a blanket and go share it with five other people. And so much of that story is threaded into what we have tried to do at Starbucks is share our blanket. It's, I mean, look, I mean, the story for sure is touching about looking out for your fellow, you know, human beings in, in moments of crisis. The idea that this is the kind of message that you want to be saying when you're um, pushing for a mass union busting campaign is just amazing. Well, I mean, um, anyone who can follow the story understands like, well, so they still went to the gas chambers. Is that correct? And I would just yeah. like make one addition to the parable, which is like, what if one guy was given a blanket that could literally cover every single person there? Yeah, that's true. Um, and uh, and he decided actually I can only I have these um, fancy formula that tell me that I can only give it the blanket to this amount of people and the other amount of people that are just gonna have to like work harder and be more deserving of the blanket next time. Yeah, actually, I mean, no, you're right. It actually, I mean, th the whole thing is obviously absurd and it, it's a terrible uh, metaphor for for the moment. Um, but if anything, it's like, you know, <laughs> Howard Schultz is there to prevent people from taking collective action together because he doesn't want to share the mass amount of wealth that he has sort of extracted from all these people. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> to start to talking to other people about sharing when he is literally, he shut down three stores in Buffalo to give them this speech, by the way, man. I don't know if you knew this. Like, they shut down three stores. They also closed permanently two other stores in Buffalo. Which um, you know what you know, that try does? To intimidate people. Well, it intimidates people. It also, like creates ill will from all the people that can't get their Starbucks all of a sudden when you do it. And it's not like the, the uh, decision by the employees and they have to mm -hmm. they have, listen to this. I mean, one thing is one takeaway is billionaires are not normal. Like this, <laughs> this sort of stuff is very strange. And I like, I, yeah, I love that they have to try to elaborate uh, something like this. Uh, no, exactly. Um, also, um, he, he also likes to share basketball teams. Uh, for instance, like the Sonics moving to yeah, Oklahoma with Oklahoma. City. Yeah, I mean that yeah. was very friendly. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, the the union vote in uh, in Buffalo is going on uh, right now, I believe. So all solidarity, and we're hoping for a positive result there. And you know, it might be from from what I understand. I mean, Starbucks has thrown every tactic, um, you know, union busting tactic that they have. They've shut down stores. They've increased the you know the quote uh shop floor they they basically hired a bunch of people coming into the vote and, and sort of said that they need to be able to vote too right which sort of dilutes the pro-union votes um you know they're basically trying to do everything that they can to try to stop this um from being successful so wishing everybody um the best of of, of luck um in in this fight because it's very clear that starbucks is very threatened just like uh amazon was uh, by the yeah. the concept of a union in their in any of their facilities Oh, it'd be nice. Uh, yeah. Godspeed, folks, please. And if you're in Buffalo, go support them in any way. And 
Like that's the thing is I want to say, um, and, and we have the strike fund in the uh, show notes. If you make a contribution to any of these sorts of um, labor uh, issues, um, tag me, Left Reckoning, and David in it, and we'll give you a retweet. Um, yeah, for sure. Like that's like like I think like yeah, more of that. Uh, if you can, if you're doing well, uh, that stuff I think is really important, and it and it helps. Like you talk about building towards like labor actions that are across sectors. It's like this is only going to happen if we start building like this sort of these ligaments and like, like this, like the first webs of the um, first threads of the web, I guess. And like, mm -hmm. I don't know, get out there for people. No, I think that's great. Well, everybody, uh, Matt, do we, are we able to go to break or should we go uh, right into it? Um, uh, would you like to go to break? We can go to break. If we could just for a second, All right, we're going to we'll take right a, a quick break and we'll be right back uh, with Paul Bowers to talk a little bit about South Carolina. All right, everybody, welcome back to Left Reckoning. Um, we are joined by someone I'm very excited to talk to, um, Paul Bowers, who is a writer and an activist in South Carolina. Um, he runs the really phenomenal Brutal South Substack, which I'll should be checking out. And I'm really excited to be talking to him a bit about the political economy of South Carolina, the history, sort of understanding that state, because I think it's a state that a lot of people think they sort of know what it represents, but it's actually, there's, there's a lot going on beneath the surface and also has a lot of power um, in the country. But thank you so much, Paul, for uh, hanging out with us tonight. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. And Matt, I know you, you've got some South Carolina roots. You said you're, you're Myrtle Beach people. Yeah, man. I, oh, I, I spent, did. I went to high school in South Carolina. Um, I was in like North Myrtle Beach, Loris area. Um, oh, okay. I, yeah. I snuck into Myrtle Beach High School through a fake address. I actually don't tell them. Um, it was a little <laughs> bit of a nicer school than the one around me. Uh, but yeah, no, I lived in South Carolina for a while. I mean, I really do love South Carolina. Um, they were a little mean. They teased me a lot about my boots and, and buckles when I first came there from Texas. But uh -oh. um, <laughs> <laughs> I did very much. I do. I do feel a soft spot for for the state, and you know, especially for the the cooking and the food and the people. And I, yeah. I really, I mean, we um, we had a listener sort of suggest that I reach out to you, and I, I looked into your work, and I, and I thought it was really phenomenal because. I do think especially people on the left, um, they sort of have a hard time understanding what the state of South Carolina is, because um, undoubtedly it's a southern state. It has you know, a deep history um, and a lot of the horrors um, in, in the south. Um, but its modern day history is a little bit more complicated. I mean, it sort of runs this line between you know the state that played a really pivotal role in american history to now having a big a made being a major like poorest state for example 
right? Like it sells a fantasy of itself. Um, Definitely. But I think a lot of people who aren't there don't realize the major industries and things like that um, that move there. Anyways, I don't want to, to preload it too much. I mean, um, I'm curious if you were to sort of talk to somebody, maybe a leftist, and sort of give them a quick flavor of what South Carolina is. I know it's a big topic. Um, um, how would you start that conversation? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, in terms of our our political economy, I kind of had to relearn that as an adult because yeah. um, we judiciously avoided a lot of that in our in our um, sort of South Carolina history courses gotcha. growing up. And um, but there's a lot there. You know, it was um, you know I, I think a lot of people are familiar with the early history mm-hmm. of this place and that it was a plantation economy. It was um, one of the major ports of entry for the transatlantic slave trade. That's I mean, Charleston in particular was a uh, grotesquely wealthy city built on uh, human misery. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's that is our origin as a state. Um, That's, you know, the political power here historically has been in and around um, Charleston, you know, Gadsden's Wharf, where we where we Mm -hmm. brought people in in chains here. Um, And that. you know, that, that was our foundation. That was, that was where the wealth came from. Um, but then, you know, like all throughout our history, there has been this thread of sort of radical possibility. Mm -hmm. Um, especially, you know, again, in in the earliest days, you know, there were times when, um, it was a plantation state, but the majority of the population here was African-American and, Mm -hmm. um, there was always, uh, the possibility of revolt uh, and revolution. Um, and a few attempts were made, you know, the Stono Rebellion, Denmark VC's attempt, um, and I mean, some successes, you know, I, the, uh, one, one thing that even a lot of South Carolina people don't know is that uh, Harriet Tubman led a, led a raid on a, um, a plantation down on Cumby Ferry and um, led Union ships up the river, um, laid siege to this place, burned the plantations to the ground and liberated people. Hmm. And that is um, as much, if not more, our heritage as a state than the um, sort of gone with the wind, horse drawn carriage tour bullshit that we uh, we sell as a as a tourist economy. Um, so I don't know. That's that that's my like early history. But like you know, all throughout we you know we after agriculture after. Um, sort of the collapse of reconstruction. We were a textile based economy. We, mm-hmm. we had a lot of textile mills here. Um, there were attempts to unionize there that were brutally repressed, including at Honey a Path. And then um, this is like super fast gloss of history. But today, you know, yeah, as, as you said earlier, like it, the, we do have a, a really, um, really powerful tourism industry. Um, Mm -hmm. especially in cities like Charleston, Myrtle beach. I mean, this is where people come to go on vacation or have their, you know, bachelor and bachelorette party or have a wedding. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm forgive my low country bias here. Upstate people will yell at me, but like so much of that here is, uh, based in our earliest sin and our earliest myth Mm -hmm. as this, um, sort of, sweet um romantic warm fuzzy plantation um people still have weddings on plantations and it's grotesque you know it's like having a uh, it's like having a wedding at a concentration camp oh, so, for sure. um so i don't know that that's i mean yeah here locally the tourism industry the wedding industry that's a that's a big thing um mm-hmm. And I mean, is still a big part of our economy here. You know, we, we, we grow more peaches than Georgia. We're pretty proud yeah, of that. Yeah, that's an important point that I knew you were going to bring that up. Yep, yeah, <laughs> that's a sticking point, man. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> I mean, the reason that for people who aren't familiar, the reason is that Georgia is just not that interesting of a place that they sort of, you know, the only thing they could think of was peaches. South Carolina has the history, so they're that's able to call a better nickname. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, so agriculture is still here, uh, and a lot of that depends on migrant labor. Um <laughs> And, um, yeah, and then we do, we do still have some manufacturing industry here, but the way, um, 
or I guess the reason that manufacturing sets up base here is um, it's cheap. We are yeah. cheap workers um, who have been um, rendered docile. Um, and that's the anti-union. Um, yep. Yep. We, we consistently rank either 49th or 50th in union density in the state. Last few mm. years have been 50th. It, it, it ranks around like, like two or 3% of the state, uh, two, two or three percent of workers are represented by union in the state. Mm. So you can go your entire life without knowing a single person who joined a union. No, I mean, I mean, that was my experience, you know, working there. I, I, I did concrete work for a while, um, mm -hmm. in, you know, in the Grand Strand. And, yeah, it was not unionized um, at all. But before before we get too contemporary, I mean, I just wanted to add a couple quick points to, you know, reckoning with and sort of wrestling with the history. I mean, I like the point that you're, I don't know, I, I make this point a lot about Texas and, uh, frankly, about the U.S. too, is that, like, you know, we have to be, we have to like write in radicals into our history and to realize that with all of the victories of like reactionary forces in our history, there were people doing something else. Right. And it is to our opponent's advantage to sort of tie everybody in with, you know, their kind of power and, and, and privilege. Right. Cause the thing that's sort of, um, different for example about like north carolina and south carolina it's like south carolina was like one of the most powerful and wealthy parts of of the country um during slavery and the families that benefited from slavery continued that power mm -hmm. um post-slavery but for like you know the average person average work i mean it was it was tough um it was a poor state for most you know kind of like wage laborers um for for most of of its history and it's fascinating to see that the wealth disparity is so strong that when you do meet wealthy families in South Carolina, they do tend to have that direct connection to owning people, you know, 150 years ago, right? Like that wealth was so immense that it, it maintains its power, um, hundred, 150 years later. And I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to like see those ruling classes as like a continuation rather than, I don't know, disappearing into the woodwork, right? Like they maintain the property and they own the land and they were able to utilize that, um, even after reconstruction. Yeah. And I mean, our, our new, I guess our, our billionaires tend to be new money, but yeah, yeah there are still, uh, like old, old families and you, you, you hear certain names and you know where mm -hmm. their money came from. Um, I mean the, the biggest newspaper in the state is owned by the Manigo family who were, um, I mean, they, they built their wealth on a plantation and on the slave trade. Um, and we're even within, a brutal industry considered especially brutal. Um, mm. Jesus Christ. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's dark. I mean, it's dark to, <laughs> to, to think of it. No, I mean, and I think it's really important um, to, to recognize that too, just because like the right really plays into the whole lost cause mythology. And it's such a big part of the, the tourism industry, as we were talking about with the plantation weddings. And I like, I like Charleston a lot. Charleston is a really wonderful town, but you know, there's not currently parts of Charleston that play into that kind of, you know, aristocrat, you know, the fan, they don't mention it, but like, what's the fantasy here? Right. You know, right. Um, it's, it's, it's being, uh, you know, on top of a, a brutal system. Right. And I think it's, it's important to be able to, to situate yourself within a place and then also um i don't know situate yourself within a, like a kind of radical history so that we can be better prepared to fight back against these kind of reactionary tellings um the, you know that we're so inundated with yeah I, can i just speak to that yeah. inundation because as a north dakota in my impressions of south dakota i mean obviously the first was uh was, was sports um but <laughs> Um, I know somebody who went to South Dakota as part of like as part of like a um, they're in sales and w won like a, a certain amount of hit a quota for sales and got to go to like the corporate retreat right and it was in South Carolina and like mm -hmm. three takeaways from that came and uh, the first one was they got to go to the BMW plant and uh, whip around the um, track with a the test uh, track yeah a test track <laughs> uh, with a with a professional driver and then be super impressed and then like w go home wanting a BMW they also got to drive to the uh, Vanderbilt mansion um so like this glorified <laughs> oligarchy and then you also have the yeah like you mentioned like the plantation tourism it's like not ideologically not the best uh like like sort of uh itinerary I guess mm. so maybe we need to update that a little bit that is a whirlwind adventure man <laughs> so, <laughs> so much <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and the upstate is wild too. I mean, it's it's such yeah. a fascinating, different is culture. It, 
Is it a coastal, like, inland yeah, dynamic? Yeah, so upstate, and correct, I, I'm pretty sure I, I'm not too rusty on this, but upstate is, like, you have to think, like, so, like, low country is, like, the eastern part of the state. It's And, and you literally just think about it, instead of thinking up, like, north-south, you're thinking about elevation, right? So as elevation, you get closer yeah. to, to the Appalachian Mountains, right, you know, the land gets higher, so it's the upstate. Um, and, like, that history is, is very different than, like, the, you know, the low country, which, like, apart from places like Myrtle Beach, which really, are like, only existed, like, 1955 plus right a lot of those towns are really really old they're old you know communities in in the south um the upstate you know a lot of that was you know later um you know in in american history that that really started to get developed so you have sort of you know you have super old towns you have railroad towns you can go through those towns i've gone through the entire boom and bust Mm -hmm. cycle um but yeah it's like it's it's not a different state i wouldn't say but it's a it's a very different history there's a distinct identity i think between low country and upstate folks Mm -hmm. definitely yeah there's a there there's some pretty fine cultural distinctions too right um and this is maybe a little too church niche for some people, but like, yeah, uh, upstate tends to be more Baptist. Um, mm-hmm. the, the low country is a little more genteel. You, uh, the, the, the base of power is more in the Episcopalian kind of tradition, I guess. I um, remember that. <laughs> and like, yeah, I mean, the upstate is where, you know, Bob Jones university is up there. I mm-hmm. mean, it's, um, it is still a stronghold for cultural conservatism. Um, mm-hmm. And that's uh, distinct, I think, in some t- in some ways from um, more secular libertarianism. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, sometimes there are uh, really interesting fights you can sort of observe between uh, the you know the cultural conservatives and the uh, strictly economic libertarians in the state. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm not picking a side there. I don't, I don't have a dog in that fight, but the, right. you know, they, yeah. they have those fights. I mean. Uh, it comes it, it comes across in the weirdest ways, like you know the the fight to take down the Confederate flag from the state mm-hmm. house grounds. The the state legislators who voted to keep it, um, nearly all were from the upstate. That is despite, fascinating, right? Despite that not being um, the you know the, the, the place where uh, the, the place that had a stake in the Civil War, you know, mm-hmm. the farmers there tended to be poorer, um, you know tenant farmers and uh, the, but yeah the the, the 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 something about the cultural politics is is different there and it, and it still holds a lot of sway i mean honestly that that might be an episode in and of itself to sort of deal with lost cause mythology because like the way that it sort of permeates the the culture is is actually really fascinating and, and baffling yeah um, but bef- before i want to get into the politics a little bit but before we get too far i do just like for people who are unfamiliar i want to introduce and we talked for a second about bmw um, but also boeing there are high profile companies that are moving to south carolina um for labor itself and primarily the promise is to get uh non-union workers um you know to sort of i mean boeing when i remember when boeing moved to south carolina it was a big deal um because Mm -hmm. I mean, not only was it a big deal for people in South Carolina, because people were excited about the opportunity of jobs and a big company moving there, but the, in the national media, it was very much a union battle, right? They were moving there to get away from a unionized workforce. And I mean, my history might be off here, um, but you know, these big moves that happened to South Carolina also coincided with an expansion across the South of big manufacturing. Um, actually moving to like places like Tennessee and Northern Georgia um, to get around the high unionization rate. So, you know, while we're looking at the entire history of the state, I think that it's worth noting um, on top of the tourism and all these other things that like, you know, there is a function for, you know, the big international like bourgeoisie, big international corporations to try to use places like South Carolina as, um, you know, spots to find unorganized labor essentially. Yeah, I mean, the, I, I I think the BMW move was a little bit before my time, but I definitely followed you know the Boeing fight closely because <laughs> that's that's right in my backyard. I'm in North Charleston, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I mean the the place they built their plant is is in North Charleston, right by the uh, the airport and the Air Force Base. And I mean, you're right. Yeah, it was uh, Boeing was looking for a new place to manufacture the Dreamliner, which is sort of its latest passenger jet at the time and um their their base at the time was in everett washington outside seattle which was unionized and so 
um, unsubtly, yeah, they, they picked their new location in the most anti-union state in the country. Um, the, the union pointed this out to the NLRB, uh, kind of went nowhere. They got a, like a settlement uh, mm-hmm. that came of it and they, you know, Boeing came here and, um, it was, it is to this day, something that you know, politicians will toot their horn about and say like, well, I helped bring Boeing here. You know, like our, our mayor still brags about this. He has like a little model of really? Boeing plane on his, on his desk and Nikki Haley still likes to brag about it. And, um, <laughs> The, I mean, the sales pitch was so transparent. It was the labor is cheap here and the people mm. um, won't have any power to push back, um, which is great if you're trying to protect your uh, your profit margins. But um, it has effects for all of us um, in and outside of the state. Uh, you know, one, one good thing about uh, mechanics unions is that they enable workers to push back on uh, safety issues in in manufacturing, you know, and, um, quality control, um, when your workforce is not unionized and you are a mechanic with the knowledge to know that something is going wrong, you are more hesitant to raise your voice. Um, Mm -hmm. and Boeing has had, um, serious issues with, with plane safety in the last few years. And, um, yeah, it does not bode well that they, are pushing more and more manufacturing to, to places like this where, uh, workers are afraid to speak up. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's like almost like internal globalization in the U S right. Um, Mm -hmm. where, you know, we, they use globalization to push wages down internationally. And now it's sort of coming back home to roost. Um, well, I wanted to get a little bit to the politics because, and we're going to get to Nikki Haley a little bit more in depth in a second, but I want to ask you this question. I don't have a particular answer to it. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on it. I do feel like South Carolina has a very large influence on our national politics, certainly historically. Um, but I think surprisingly so, and I don't mean this is a dig against South Carolina, but even still today, you know, for a state that, you know, it's not, it's not a massive population. Um, but I would, I would hanger that most folks, um, sorry, would wager that most folks know more politicians from South Carolina, uh, or at least senators from South Carolina than they do North Carolina, for example. Like, why does South Carolina have such a large influence on national politics, do you think? Yeah, it is interesting. And I guess uh, I'm always interested in the ones that fly under the radar here. People like Mick <laughs> Mulvaney, um, who's not, not a household name for a lot of people. He doesn't go mm-hmm. on as many of the talk shows, but like... Um, was one of the only people who stuck around for the entire Trump presidency. He was mm-hmm. his OMB director and uh, served like three different roles in the Trump White House. Um, just kind of quietly plugging along, um, doing terrible things. You know? <laughs> um, but we do have like, yeah, there are people that you know uh, are, are widely known outside the state, um, dating back to John C. Calhoun, um, who uh, was our, uh, our native son who upheld slavery as a positive good, um, in the great debates of his time. Um, but yeah, today I think, I don't know that there are a lot of factors, but I mean, one is that we hold the first primaries in the South. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're always one of the first primary States and, you know, we end up being a, a, a turning point for a lot of elections, you know, on, on both sides. Um, you know, we, uh, South Carolina was a decisive victory for Trump and it was a decisive victory for Biden in 2020. Mm -hmm. I mean, that South Carolina is where the democratic establishment, um, really hammered a nail into the Bernie campaign. Um, Mm -hmm. and I don't know. I mean, it's hard to ascribe motivation, but I mean, the effect you can see is that on the Republican side, um, South Carolina serves as a barometer for where cultural conservatives will land. Yeah. Um, so like the fact that evangelicals would uh, hold their nose or even gleefully vote for a man like Donald Trump um, really opened the floodgates, you know, like, Oh, if, if Christians are fine with this guy who is <laughs> by any definition, anti-Christ, then all bets are off. Right. Um, and then yeah, on the Democratic still, I mean, when he was elected, I, I'm just saying that I remember talking to folks and I was dead wrong about Trump. 
um, mm. in, in, in 16. I remember telling people, was like, you know, there's nothing that people there hate more than just like a Yankee billionaire. Um, right, yeah. you know, but I, and I was dead wrong. I mean, like he was able to break through it. Um, yep. so yeah, no, I think it isn't, you're, you're right. That is an interesting barometer of, of how folks are feeling, what they're going to accept even. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah, what they what they would tolerate or what they uh, actually it turns out love. Um, <laughs> well, and then the, the whole, I mean, on the Democratic side, I mean, it's 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 a primary mm-hmm. uh, where the voters, um, especially if they are you know under forty or fifty years of age, have only ever known defeat. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Republicans have held a trifecta of power in the state since the early two thousands. It's actually more recent than you would think, but. Um, uh, you know, the Southern strategy really kind of hit its stride here. Some of its earliest architects are from here, but um, yeah, we didn't fully transition away from democratic control to Republican control until like Oh two Oh three, I want to say. Um, mm. But I mean, yeah, I mean, for me, I'm 33 years old, you know, like I can, I can spend my whole life voting for Democrats and seeing nothing come of it, you know, yeah, it's um, like a ritual. <laughs> Yeah, it's just like, um, yeah, it's uh, you can you can do it cathartically, I suppose. But like, yeah, you're you're voting for people in the state house who maybe fight a few good fights, but practically always lose um, mm-hmm. because they, there is no they have no one to build coalition with. They have no path to power, um, and that's only going to be cemented through gerrymandering this year. Yes, and I can't imagine um, how bad that's looking there frankly i mean that and then also i mean then this is across the south it's like this kind of th- there's a lot of migration that we're seeing all across the country but that, that's going southward but particularly this kind of bizarre suburban right-wing move to the south right tech oh, I, you know i'm in austin and like austin's a city that really is struggling with that all these people are like oh we need to come back to like the real america i feel like a lot of like the angriest conservatives i knew in when i was living in south carolina were like from new jersey and new york no uh, definitely <laughs> yeah and what i'm saying is like you're you're importing like an even you know a reactionary voter base too along with an entrenched power structure that is trying to gerrymander i mean it's a very difficult mm-hmm. um task to, to break through um we got to- still true in myrtle beach for sure and yeah, yeah, I, I should speak about charles yeah. very different um more and more in Ori, i mean uh, like hilton head area too and people retire there because the taxes are Mm-hmm. Um, and so you end up with yeah people who who came here to evade taxes, um, and I, I, I mean don't care about the schools, you know, not that right. Most they have no stake in the school, but like they don't think about the kids as their kids, right? Uh, <laughs> right. Um, yeah. I want to get to this Nikki Haley stuff, but I do just want to note um, one thing because I was saying this to Matt beforehand, and I didn't realize people don't know this. Um, you know, Tim Scott, um, the South Carolina senator. Um, and he, he has a lot of similarities, actually, to Nikki Haley, the way that the GOP sort of prompts them up as like, look, these are, you know, people of color who are sort of with our program. And we're going to get to Nikki Haley in a second. But I want to remind people that, like, t- like Tim Scott really does represent a, con- a very particular kind of conservative version of politics, not only um, in, like, what he does as a senator, Right. Um, but what his life story is. And I was telling Matt this before, like the big thing that happened in his life is that, you know, he, he, you know, grew up in a troubled home, but then he got a job at Chick-fil-A and his manager at Chick-fil-A like showed him the right way. And there's something about that story to me that is just like, this is like, you know, the pure mythology of a certain kind of South Carolina conservative that it's only through, you know, minimum wage labor, especially at Chick-fil-A, which also just, in the, you know, just represents so much of a, of a certain kind of culture. Like that was what was able to mold. It wasn't the school system. It wasn't the community. It was like cold, hard capitalism teaching him, you know, the value of a dollar and, and to put away all those kind of bad habits that he had inherited from his family uh, i think that it's, it's really important to recognize and obviously i'm saying that tongue-in-cheek that's not my beliefs but like um you know that's the uh you know there is something about tim scott that i think that people forget that like at least the way that he sort of presented or taught to people um very does very much does fit into a kind of i don't know narrative ideological narrative yeah and i can i can understand the appeal of it um as a former Chick-fil-A fry cook myself, um, actually, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah, Chick-fil-A is such a cipher for understanding um, 
a certain view of the world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, there, there's, you know, there's only so much we could do with that. It's just, it's just funny enough to me that like, I think that most people don't realize that it's just, I don't know. It's just something that a dad would make up, frankly, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like the perfect, the perfect uh, political subject. Well, well, exactly. yeah. It's perfect because it hits people right in the gut because every, like if one culture is pervasive in America, it's fast food culture. So you're like really on the best highway into people's uh, hearts is talking about their fast food that they like right <laughs> no i mean especially when so much cultural content is sort of being sucked out of our society it's like you know franchises like become like our stand-in for community uh, for mm-hmm. a lot of folks well, but anyways, we got we got yeah, this nikki yeah. we, we're, we're going on for a while and we can <laughs> I want to get this Nikki Haley stuff because it is really fascinating. And I think that she's a figure that people should be uh, checking out. Um, Paul, um, you wrote a piece on, on Nikki Haley's, what is it, Dull War, war on, on Socialism. Um, yeah. And her sort of, her what is this, second chapter, third chapter of her political career right now. Could you sort of tell people what Nikki Haley has been doing after she left the uh, high offices of the United Nations? Yeah, it's been a source of fascination for me. Um, she... Uh, yeah, as you say, I guess this is like her third sort of round uh, trying to build a public career. But yeah, I mean, she started out, um, you know, working for her, her parents' company. She grew up in Bamberg, which is very rural, um, uh, became a state lawmaker, um, and then very quickly rose to become uh, governor and um, beat a really competitive primary field, including current Governor Henry McMaster, and mm-hmm. um, became the first. I mean, the, the the headlines she made nationally were that she was the first woman and the first um, non-white governor in, in state history, and um, so yeah, she she sort of instantly got a national profile. Um, served as governor, um, had a, uh, I mean, did about as much damage as as any other Republican would in that office um, mm-hmm. in terms of defunding of public infrastructure and schools um, in terms of uh, union busting. I mean, she, she explicitly fought unions and um, recorded radio ads, discouraging people from joining unions at Boeing when they came here. Um, so anyway, um, was rewarded with a, a seat at the United Nations uh, by Donald Trump. Um, so was our UN ambassador for a few years there. I think that was, I want to say 2017 to 19. I hope you getting the years wrong, but um, mm-hmm. stepped down as the, the, the Trump years wound, wound down and um, then sort of went quiet. And she's always been uh, very ambitious. I mean, every four years, someone brings her up as either a presidential candidate or running mate, um, you know, uh, and she's never she's never really made any serious moves toward that. So there's speculation as soon as she left the UN, like, Oh, what's she going to do? Is she going to run for president? Is she going to move back to South Carolina? She actually bought, uh, bought a mansion um, in South Carolina on, I want to say it's Seabrook Island. One one of the sea islands that has become just sort of a a private Island for millionaires. And um, so everybody was like, well, what's she going to run for? And so far, nothing. She has a super PAC um, that has a, a ton of money, but um, hasn't announced for any particular office. And instead, she has started this thing. Um, this it's a five hundred one c four organization called Stand for America. And um, I, you, would, I mean, I don't know how social media ads target geographically. You know, if, mm-hmm. if you all ever see them, but. I saw a lot for Stand for America shortly after she left the UN. And Fascinating. Didn't really make much of it. Um, the the thing that really brought it onto my radar was my my parents ended up on some mailing list or another, and they got physical mail from Nikki Haley um, earlier this year. What an honor! The governor sending your parents mail. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the letter from the um, king. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And they they were kind of um, kind of baffled by it, and I mean knew knew that I would get a kick out of it. Um, and they brought over this envelope because it had a letter from Nikki Haley. Uh, it was stamped with "Stand for America," and it had a um, a banknote from from Venezuela. It was a um, <laughs> uh, what's the what's the currency? The Bolivar. A Bolivar, yeah. Um, it was like a hundred <laughs> Bolivars, and there's like this long sort of like john birch style letter with it about the evils of socialism and how like 
uh, you know, people have to spend a wheelbarrow full of, of paper money to buy a loaf of bread there. And like, it's only because of socialism. That's what it is. And, um, it was odd. And it was like, Nikki, like, <laughs> is this really what you're doing with all this political capital? You're just like, you're just hitting up people's parents for money. Like, <laughs> And I, I did some research. I, I, you know, got some IRS docs, and I still don't completely get it. Like, I don't know why it exists. It's like it's redundant. I mean, it's 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 a political apparatus that says the same things as the Heritage Foundation or kind of like the neocon mm -hmm. uh, think tank world. I mean, it's like it's like PragerU but boring. Like, I, I don't know what it does exactly, but. It's got a bunch of money. It spends like uh, so far they've spent a million and a half dollars on Facebook ads. That's to wild. what end? I I still don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean. So that's that's what she's up to now. Well, well we have this clip here. I'm going to play in one second um, because I, it is actually interesting to see where she's positioning herself. But before we get to it. I mean, I don't know either. Right. And and you would know more than me. I mean, there's a part of me when it comes to Nikki Haley, having seen her, you know, my first election was, uh, the first time I voted was against Nikki Haley. So, yeah. um, you know, I've, <laughs> I, I've been following her for a while. Um, for Vince Shaheen. <laughs> yeah. For Vince Shaheen, who's like the most yeah. milk toast Democrat ever, but it was my yeah. first time voting. I was very excited. Um, actually the funniest thing is I had a bumper sticker on my car and I remember like my wheel, popping or something like that later and the the mechanic like giving me a really hard time <laughs> like six <laughs> months after the election <laughs> um but anyways i mean nikki haley is fascinating because i'm gonna be honest i actually think that when it comes to having a kind of general political skill i actually do think that she has an ability to she can speak she's clever she's a you know, she, her, she's horrendous. Don't get me wrong, but you know, we're just judging talent. Like the yeah. Republicans could do a lot worse than Nikki Haley. Right. I don't know exactly. how well she's playing, but like they, they, you know, they put up Jeb Bush. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right? She's not visibly a mutant like Mitch McConnell. Or all these <laughs> right. other people. She, she does do these two things. Like, I guess what I'm saying is with Nikki Haley is I've never been able to understand is if she's a true believer or if she's just completely cynical. Right. And throughout her life and throughout her political career, I've, I've leaned either way. So I, I am just going to say judgment is out because there's a part of me that thinks like, this is a great gig for her to just sort of like do politics without ever having to do politics again. Right. She just yeah. gets to send people like freak out mailers about socialism and live on a right. nice mansion. Um, That's what Jim DeMint did. That was, yeah. Favorite. Which yeah. is he left Congress and the the biggest heritage. Senator. Yeah. Like <laughs> um, early retirement. Yeah. But, but anyways, but, but when she does speak, when she does make her interventions, I mean, she does play a, a, a role within that party, or at least for a very specific kind of, um, economic conservative, right? Like very free market pro capitalist. We were talking earlier about how she was a union buster. I mean, she, when people talk about conservatives in the sense of like, what, what is the GOP like from a Marxist perspective, you know, drop the cultural stuff. What does the GOP really do? It's like the hammer to break labor's power, um, mm -hmm. particularly in the South. And Nikki Haley plays that role. Well, uh, we have this clip of her, um, I think it might be speaking at the Heritage Foundation, but I could be incorrect about that. Um, but it's just very interesting because a lot of people, especially in our world, are getting very um, alarmed about like the Josh Halleys or maybe less so in possibilities of him winning, but what he represents like the J.D. Vances, right? This kind of new, what they're calling, you know, like the populists, like Republican. Right populists. Yeah. Right populists. Thank you, Matt. Um, and this talk from her, is very much hitting at that. And yes. I think it's interesting to see, you know, if, if she does have a political role, this is what she's is sort of representing. Well, if this is going to let me play it. Yeah, get um, on blank screen now. All right, well, hold on. Cool. I'll bring you, just give me one second. We'll edit this out later. <laughs> I hate these. Um, we're using new software. Oh, so yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's Nikki Haley trying to slow me down. Um, <laughs> let me see if I can, maybe if I pull this up, it'll work. But, I mean, while I'm bringing this up, I mean, I wanted to, like, another moment in her life was after the the horrible murders in, in Charleston. Was her giving a speech, um, and I remember it very, like, vividly, 
sort of talking about racism in South Carolina um, mm-hmm. in a way. Let's see if this she, she talked about like her own personal struggle with like racism and things that happened to her father in a way that never really addressed like the elephant in the room. It was basically like my father dealt with racist attacks and I became the governor of South Carolina, which I think is a great story, mm-hmm. um, you know, in the sense of like, well, it's wonderful that, you know, you weren't condemned to just, you know, you know, terrible things. But like, you know, you she she like sort of left the tradition of her family. She changed faiths. You know, she had to sort of represent this politics that was very much not pro immigrant or pro people coming to this country. I don't know. There's yeah. a part of her that I think can be very cynical. Well, um, I would just say most people I'd say maybe in all, in fact, all of them besides her did not get to uh, also be governor after experiencing <laughs> that racism. So. That's true. All right. Let's see if this works. Uh, no sound. Sorry. All right. It, I, uh, just give me one second. We'll have it. Um, I apologize, everybody, for. <laughs> no, I, I heard it. It was a little quiet, though. Yeah, I was just coming. I can get it. it it's just. Um, I try to do this to be really fancy for everybody. I want to impress everybody and not do things <laughs> through a Twitter video. I downloaded it. All right, this will work. Well, let me make sure it will work because that would be really embarrassing if it doesn't. <laughs> um, okay. Here we go. It pains me to see some of our friends turning their backs on our principles. They're similar to the frightened Tories Margaret Thatcher faced in 1980. You know what I'm talking about. The conservatives who claim capitalism no longer works. They conclude that economic freedom fails families and hurts workers. So they're trying to create a hybrid capitalism, a hyphenated capitalism. It's all a sham. Tear off the window dressing, and they're calling for more mandates, more rules, and more government control of the economy and our daily life. They want to create more welfare programs and accelerate government spending. It's unthinkable, but they're fine with less personal freedom and more government power. That's not capitalism. It's socialism light. There was a time when conservatives understood that. In fact, There used to be a name for it, the, quote, dime store New Deal. It's nothing more than bigger government, just not as big as the socialists want. Well, good luck with that. Conservatives will never outbid the left when it comes to growing government. I just Googled the fighting Tories and nothing yeah. comes up. I have no idea. Like, that, you know what we're talking about. Like, no. It, the, the only you thing know, that comes the fighting up, Tories that we all know and love. Yeah. yeah. Like, what comes up is when, like, she was forced out of office like by the Tories. Like, it wasn't her standing up that. I don't know what the hell she's talking about. And then we all know Dime Store. New Deal. Nikki Haley, I mean, how, like, dude, I mean, how, how old, old are you? You're baiting yourself, and she's not that old. Exactly. Right? Like know, a dime like, store. Like, Berman said something like that. It's like, oh, yeah, you were around for that. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki Haley's not that old. It's like like my dad would sometimes call a movie theater a show hall, and he's like, what the fuck? Okay. Sure. <laughs> right. No, I mean, but it is really interesting to see her because she was sort of supposed to be the young face of the American conservative movement for a while, um, really hitting hard at like what seems to be the new genre of it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, she's supposed to be the young face, but yeah, it makes these these oddly dated references to the the Thatcher era or (laughs) like sort of like deep cuts from from the reagan era she'll she'll name drop in speeches now and it's like um yeah it's it's a different it's a different brand than you know the the holly conservatism it's not um and it's not the the libertarian sort of um like her predecessor in office mark sanford would be the you know exemplar of the the conservative wing she is like um I guess a neocon. If you had to like put her in a mm-hmm. camp, she's. Um, I mean, people you know, should know, for example. With, yeah. No, no. I keep going. I just want to say for people who are familiar, like you know, she took down the the Confederate flag after after the murders in Charleston, which was way claimed, too late. Claimed credit for taking it down. Yeah, claimed Renews credit. I don't mean to give her, but I'm just saying, like, people need to understand, like, you know, where she sort of fits into, especially the Southern conservative movement. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. It, 
Right. I, I, God, she still milks that to this day. And it's like, I'm sure she yeah, did. It was, it was the barest concession to decency. Um, yeah. And right, right up until the, the, the massacre at a church, she was defending the Confederate flag. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the NAACP challenged her on it over and over again. And she gave a speech once where she said, well, I haven't heard any complaints about the Confederate flag from business leaders. So we're going <laughs> to leave it up. Certainly not from yeah. Maurice's barbecue, um. <laughs> the passenger clan. Um, but yeah, she's like, yeah, she does. She throws in some oddly dated references, and I, I, I don't know what to make of it other than like maybe she just has old dudes as speechwriters. But I mean, one that was really interesting. This was last year at the RNC. She gave a speech where the the big applause line was "America is not a racist country." Mm-hmm. Um, which I have a Google alert for that exact phrase and get new results every day. That's <laughs> she was one of, if not the first person to like recite that line verbatim. And it's, it's still like just a constant drumbeat, but she, she mentioned uh Jean Kirkpatrick in that speech, who was like an advisor <laughs> to Reagan. She, she wrote, I had to Google this. I didn't, I didn't know this history. She wrote the Kirkpatrick doctrine, which was a specific sort of, um, I guess extension of like, oh God, the Monroe Doctrine, the Roosevelt Corollary, saying that the United States can and should be the police of Latin America. Um, and Kirkpatrick mm-hmm. um, authorized the, the training of death squads in, in Central America. Um, so, yeah, Haley's That's who she's speaking herself. to, right? Like, like that's right. who she's, she's talking to, like, old Bush guys and those sorts of, mm-hmm. because, and she's speaking against like this new Teal backed like Blake Masters mm-hmm. and JD Vance, but also like Teal's just trying to do what the Koch brothers basically did. I think like to yeah. create their own sort of like new satellite of, of candidates. And I think like Haley's like, well, no one's going back to the guys who actually won stuff like 30, 40 years ago. I'm going to be their horse basically. Right. Yeah. That, that does seem to be, yeah, her, her brand and all this. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, she's a, a debt hawk, but also a, a war hawk. Um, <laughs> I mean, if you look at the messaging she pushes out again through this stand for America thing, um, a lot of it is saber rattling about, um, China and Iran, um, mm-hmm. and the people who want war again, are, are focused on those countries and looking for an excuse. Um, so yeah, it is this sort of like cold war era, um, throwback that she's, she's selling right now. So I, I don't know where that's headed, but, uh, it's not good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, that, that's the thing is like, yeah, we'll have to see if she's just a divining board for the donors or is representing some, um, new movements. I'd love to get you back on sometime soon to talk um, mini golf. But in the last yes. couple of minutes, I know we took you on a little bit uh, later, but in, in the last couple of minutes, I, I think it's always helpful to end these interviews. And these are tough times. Um, so we don't have to have anything too big here. But, you know, what are some things in South Carolina that are sort of giving you hope, some openings that you're seeing, you know, community organizing, et cetera, that, you know, maybe because we, I know we do have listeners, um, particularly in Columbia and Charleston, um, but anywhere across the state. I, don't, I mean, like, you know, what are your feelings right now as, as someone living in South Carolina, where are you seeing these kind of openings and, you know, and hope and the kind of leftist struggle for a better future? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, for me, um, as a parent of, of kids in, in public school here and as uh, someone who was uh, the education reporter at the, the paper in Charleston for a few years, mm-hmm. the um, one of the greatest moments of hope I saw while not um, necessarily explicitly left was teacher labor. Um, mm-hmm. Teachers got fed up around the same time here that they did in a lot of other states. Um, a year or two after the you know the walkouts popped off in West Virginia, Oklahoma, Arizona, there were um, smaller but significant movements in North and South Carolina. Um, they they had a you know a series of protests on on May first, two years in a row. Um, uh, one in which I. It was the largest uh, protest event on the state house grounds in recorded history. Ten thousand people marched on the state house, led by teachers. Um, so many walked out that they shut down school districts, wow. only for one day. You know, mm-hmm. it didn't 
it didn't have sort of the infrastructure or the like uh i guess the the focus to 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 maintain that walkout beyond one day but um it was it was the only thing i've seen in my adult life that put um republicans on their heels here mm. um they had to listen um so yeah first and foremost yeah it, teacher labor i mean teachers are tired <laughs> like uh so tired right now but um yeah I, I think if workers are going to assert their value here i think um teachers can and should lead the way yeah. um sc for ed is um kind of the um the most active group it's, it's more recently formed it's not it's it's not officially affiliated but sometimes works in coalition with like the SCEA affiliate here in the state but um they're the ones who get things done and they're teacher led um so yeah SC for ed uh continues to give me hope um i think other than that there is um there are occasional you know like small small pockets of labor, labor organizing uh, we've mm -hmm. had two newspapers unionized in the last couple of years That's both big. owned by mcclatchy actually uh the one down in beaufort was the first tiny tiny newsroom covering beaufort and hilton head uh followed by the state which is a big newspaper in mm -hmm. the state capital columbia um so yeah i mean the, the news guild is is organizing here as you know they, they've had a lot of success all over the country but um and then I, I, the one other thing I would say that's been interesting is um, organizing for housing justice. Mm -hmm. um, rent is is out of control here as everywhere, um, especially in places like Charleston. Um, it, it's it's through the roof. I mean, um, people can't afford to live in the same city where they work, um, especially if you if you uh, work for the tourism industry or hospitality. Mm -hmm. I mean, people you know have to drive in or take our decrepit bus system in from the next county. And um, so there are, um, you know, a few, a few sort of rays of light, I would say. Um, one is there's a South Carolina housing justice network that I've gotten to do a little bit of work with um, full disclosure. I've, I've helped them out a little bit. Um, there's a, there's a tenant led group called Charles house um, led by my friend, Miracle Mozzie here in Charleston, who's a tenant in the Charleston housing authority, public housing, and got so fed up um, that she um, invited a news crew to film the, the abysmal living conditions of her, of her home. Um, wow. and she took that step and it inspired a lot of other tenants to come to her and say, yeah, like I have the same problems, but I was afraid I, you know, I didn't have the guts to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, it's still in the early days, but like it is, um, you know, tenants organizing to protect each other and protect themselves and their families. Um, so yeah. Uh, Charles house. And I got a, I got a shout out DSA. I am, uh, yeah. again, in full disclosure, I'm the, I'm the, uh, recently elected com comms secretary for Charleston DSA. So we're one of the, the two, um, fully, I guess, uh, official chapters in the state, Charleston and Columbia. And, um, yeah, so we've got, uh, pretty exciting work going on in, in the areas of housing justice, uh, labor, uh, getting a start, and a, a foothold in electoral politics um you know, we're, we're over 200 strong as a chapter and um it's uh it's something that gives me hope you know there's a lot to despair about but like yeah yeah it, it's given me like meaningful work to do you know <laughs> so um yeah uh support dsa in uh in places where you wouldn't expect to find it i mean i, I love that i mean i'll, I'll just say as a, as a top note i think that there is a lot of opportunity in tenant organizing across the country because it is just it's something that affects so many people i think a lot of people can understand why you need to organize um, to fight back yeah. and also i'll just say as somebody i haven't been back to south carolina i, I really need to but I, I i mean it's not really by choice as much but like i haven't been back to south carolina since i left over a decade ago um but what i always remind folks is like when i left i had no you know and i was like a little socialist leaving out um no way would i have imagined 
10 years later that there'd be, you know, a, a growing socialist organization in, in Charleston. And I think it's really important for people to like, to take stock in that and realize that like, look, the things, things are bad right now, but they'd be a lot worse if people weren't doing anything about them. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying let's sit on our butts and all like pat each other on the back, but like people are doing things and that's really, really exciting. And that should give us all a lot of hope. Paul, I really liked having you on. I'd love to have you on sometime in the future. People should definitely check out um, Brutal South Substack. Is there anything else we should point them to? That's the main thing. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a newsletter. Uh, you can also look me up on wherever you get podcasts. It's the same name. It's called Brutal South. It's a really it's phenomenal. The Substack, yeah. the writing is great, and the podcast is really interesting as well. People definitely should check it out. And uh, we'll put ways for people to follow your work in the show notes, etc. Thanks again, Paul. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Thanks, Paul. Take care. See you. Man, are we able to go to a break? I just want to check yeah. out the video for our next segment. We'll be going on a break for about 30 seconds. We're coming back. We're coming with a lot of stuff. We're coming with Obama. We're coming with AOC. We're coming with Abby Martin. What more Pelosi. could you want? <laughs> what, what more you want is Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> yeah, Nancy yeah. Pelosi, too. Everyone's favorite. The leader of the socialist revolution of the United States of America. <laughs> we're back in a little bit, folks.
All right, folks, we are back. And now it's time to get really annoyed at the uh, complete ecological collapse being ignored by the powers that be. Including ones yeah. that should not be ignoring it in a way that they are. But uh, maybe we should start with uh, Nancy first. Yeah, we have a real rogues gallery. Um, you know, for people who were watching this, um, we have broken down how disappointing COP uh, 26 has been, particularly Joe Biden's role in it. Um, this is just going to be a kind of waltz down enemy lane. <laughs> um, because the, the fact is, is that... You know, the Democrats can hand about the Republicans all they want, but they are the party in power. And it becomes very clear when they're challenged by people in the know that they have very little intention of actually dealing with this crisis. Um, so, yeah, we got we got some more stuff um, to get to um, in a moment. But let's start with Abby Martin. I'm sure everybody is familiar with her, does incredible work, asking a phenomenal question to Nancy Pelosi and a host of other American uh, representatives um, about, um, at COP26 about the U.S. military budget. I want a woman. I want a woman. A woman. A woman. Already. Just got... Oh, that's amazing. I didn't even catch yeah. that the first round. Yeah, exactly. Abby got picked on because she's a woman. Gender equality here. Uh, Maybe I don't, but... <laughs> Abby Martin with the Empire Files. Speaker Pelosi, you just presided over a, a large increase in the Pentagon budget. This Pentagon budget is already massive. The Pentagon is a larger polluter than 140 countries combined. How can we seriously talk about net zero if there is this bipartisan consensus to constantly expand this large contributor to climate change, which is exempt from these conferences? Military is exempt from climate talks. Well, I, I just want to use an example, if I can. Um, you know the sea level rise is an important part of uh, you know, what's happening to the climate. And I am not a defense person, but I've had so many talks with the Defense Department, with the Navy in particular, about how they have to respond to what's going on. So I really do think that there is no reason why what we're putting together, you know, uh, with Build Back Better and other things, can't respond to the Defense Department and, and, and have the same impact in terms of reducing emissions. And I do think that the Defense Department is very much aware of the fact that they have to play a major role, both from a strategic as well as, you know, for the good of the world. So I don't see what we're doing in any way or, you know, increasing the defense budget as being something that's inconsistent with climate action. I really don't. Yeah. And may I just add that um, the national security advisors all tell us that the climate crisis is a national security matter. Uh, it is, of course, a health matter for our children, the water they drink, the air they breathe, etc. It is a jobs issue between clean, good, clean technologies uh, being the future of our workforce yeah. and the training for all of that. It is a national security issue because of the uh, uh, all of the con conditions that climate crisis produces, I won't go into all of them, but they do ca are cause for migration, conflict over habitat and resources, and again, uh, a security challenge. Just I mean, amazing. So, yeah, like not, not, and what's amazing about it is like, they don't even know what she's asking. Right, like they think like, oh yeah, they recognize global warming as a threat. The, the question is, do they understand their role in exacerbating that threat as like one of the main single bodies responsible for like the, the rising sea levels that they're supposedly aware of? I'm glad that the fucking Navy is aware the sea level is rising. That is fairly like, the bare minimum. I mean, it's it's it should be frightening to folks, um, their answer. One, because they do not acknowledge Abby's fundamental question, which is, why are militaries exempt from these climate talks? Abby comes out with the facts, right, which is that the United States military is the largest polluter in the glo on the globe, right? And instead of dealing with that, right, and she's asking, why are these parts of crucial parts of the government not a part of these conversations about reaching you know our our goals for emissions um beyond that what's the answer that you get from them nancy pelosi saying that in a world of you know 
insecure climate that she's being told by military leaders that the United States is going to need to turn itself into a fortress to protect its water and air from, you know, uh, you know, um, you're, we're assuming here, you know, just people trying to come into the country. I mean, it's a barbaric answer, not only because it re refuses to answer what the very real concerns that Abby's uh, making about the emissions of the U.S. military, but actually in, in her answer to that saying that like, oh, well, they're aware about it. They're protect. They're preparing to like kill people or turn the United States into a fortress to prevent migration into the country. Yeah, it reveals their preoccupations <laughs> and, and completely misses everybody else's. We have this um, here too uh, from uh, Stephen Selmer, um, Semler, excuse me, uh, who's a good follow. Um, let me pull it up. Excuse me. Um, yeah, it says Lockheed Martin received more federal funding this year than the amount of climate programs we'll get in Biden's reconciliation bill. I mean, from what we know of Biden's reconciliation bill. Um, but yeah, so far, $55.5 billion. Lockheed Martin gets 75.2. Also, Raytheon and General Dynamics add them up together. They're about as much as that $55 billion. And, you know, Bo Boeing and Northrop Grumman get about half of it between them two. So, you know, it's really a Santa Claus day for our uh, defense contractors. <laughs> it truly is. I mean, you know, I, I, I think rightfully so, um, this Comp 26 um meeting has been sort of portrayed and people sort of understand it for what it is is a great opportunity for um fossil fuel lobbyists to green greenwash um their activities and we haven't even started the much more dip like we talk about like Okay, fossil fuel companies, like just like logically, I think most people can understand like their role as like opponents um, um, when we're trying to deal with climate change, right? We haven't even started the damn work um, politically in this country of helping people understand that the U.S. military is like a major force that is, you know, causing climate change, right? And the answer that we get there um, from these folks is not only inadequate, but quite frightening. Yeah, it's insane. So we got two more. Let's let's get fired up. Let's go down from from worse to bad. How about that? Sure. Um, we got two Obamas here. A private citizen now, isn't that crazy? You're probably wondering how and, I got here. I got here by a private yet, jet. <laughs> I'm sorry to be depressing everybody. I know people get mad when we go on these, but this is what we're up against, and I think it's important to rec recognize it. Um, what Obama, like, you know, people focus a lot on how Obama, like, personally disappointed them, um, you know, when he, he didn't win. Um, it wasn't so much the case for me, not because I'm better than anybody, but I just, like, I wasn't particularly into Democratic politicians when he first got elected. So by the time I became a good lefty, it was too late uh, for me to get wrapped up in that. So I don't, what I'm saying is, like, I don't, like, I don't have that kind of personal feel. Like, Obama hurt, broke my heart, right? I was never into it. Um, yeah, but it is amazing to watch him now. As far away from the presidency as he is, right, as far away, frankly, from even like, you know, other than making a few like hit calls against Bernie Sanders, um, as far away from even the party itself as he is to sort of come out, trot himself out from time to time to point the finger at activists and leftists um, for the state of the world instead of people like him, um, his party or his good friend Joe Biden or his friends. Or, yeah, that shoot off rockets into space. We got a lot to get to. So this is the first, this is from COP. This is the first clip of Obama that we have. This is him hyping up the young people, telling them about the, you know, the opportunities that they have in front of them. Bombarded with warnings about what the future will look like if you don't address climate change. And meanwhile, you've grown up watching many of the adults who are in positions to do something about it, either act like the problem doesn't exist or refuse to make the hard decisions necessary to address it. You are Hello. right to be frustrated. Folks in my generation have not done enough to deal with a potentially cataclysmic problem that you now stand in here. You individually. Vote like your life depends on it because it does. I recognize that a lot of young people may be cynical about politics, but the cold hard fact is we will not have more ambitious climate plans coming out of governments unless governments feel some pressure from voters. Yes, the process will be messy. 
I guarantee you, every victory will be incomplete. But if we work hard enough for long enough, those partial victories add up. Vote like your life depends on it. Like you did in 2016, like you did in 2008, like you did in 2012, like you did in 2020. I mean, the message from there is is beyond cynical. It's perverse. Um, they have been delivered. He has been delivered. Do you remember there was a time when this person had a supermajority in Congress, and now his you know protege? Can we just Biden, talk about like folks in my generation haven't done enough? Yeah, you. Particularly, yeah. if there's if there's one single individual of your generation that did not do enough, it was you. Like that's who you're thinking. Yeah. No, and spare me, spare me all of the shit, all of the the kind of the excuses about oh well, you know the Republican opposition, etc. Again, super majorities under o Obama, Biden. Oh yeah, oh fair marginal uh, majority in Congress, Biden was has been given by climate activists from the get-go a list of climate-based executive orders that he could have done on day one. The point is that there is not the political will or the desire from th these people in this party to deliver. So don't fucking sit here and say, like, you need to be voting for me harder, right? Yeah, vote I mean, for Joe Manchin just, harder. <laughs> vote for Joe Manchin harder, vote for Kristen Cinema harder, and vote for all the other ghouls who are behind the scenes and very happy that they don't have to be the public face of the anger on this. There is plenty of pressure on these politicians to do the right thing. The fact is, is that these politicians are much more beholden to the financial interests that ha are already invested in extracting the oil that's in the ground today um, and burning that shit up than they are in providing a safe future for us and for our children um i it's just it's amazing and it's it's funny to see obama though in this new chapter of his life go from being the hope and change guy to the a bunch of little stuff adds up <laughs> you know do more <laughs> vote on. more right vote, vote twice uh, the, the, <laughs> like look at it again squint and you'll see the difference there is no supermajority that you will deliver Obama and the Democratic Party as it exists today that will do significant action on climate change. You can see that with how hollow even the progressive caucus is in this country, right? When it comes to push to shove, and boy, we're going to criticize some members of that movement in a second, right? Um, but when it comes down to it, it's like Rashida Tlaib, it's AOC, and it's Ilhan Omar, Presley sometimes, Bowman sometimes, right? Um you know, it's it's that's what we what we have like to sit here and say like all these we're just waiting for five more people and then we're going to be able to do all this stuff. It's like no, no. There are literally five people who are willing to maybe do the kind of medium to large stuff that we need, and that's not a bad. Anyways, the point is is not to get doom and gloom. It's to understand that what we need to do is we need to be building green movements that are rooted in people and rooted in labor, and to not fucking wait for this part to catch up. I don't want to. Um, there, there's more. Obama, so let's save a little bit of energy because it's worth watching both of these. That was a, a collection of, of clips. Um, but this is this is also a, a speech that this is from that same speech too, just concentrated. Protests are necessary. Oh, you're muted. I just want to say right quick that what he is about to say is going to make your blood boil. Right. Uh, again, because the way that he takes the inaction of himself and the people in fucking power and tries to redirect it on us is just incredible. But y'all watch for yourself. To raise awareness. Hashtag campaigns can spread awareness. Protests are necessary to raise awareness. Hashtag campaigns can spread awareness. But to build the broad-based coalitions necessary for bold action, we have to persuade people who either currently don't agree with us or are indifferent to the issue. And to change the minds of those fellow citizens in our respective countries 
We have to do a little more listening. We can't just yell at them or say they're ignorant. We can't just tweet at them. It's not enough to inconvenience them through blocking traffic in a protest. We actually have to listen to their objections and understand the reluctance of some ordinary people. It's not ordinary people that are preventing meaningful action on climate change. Unbelievable. To, to say that is amazing, right? Basically, the, like him acting like the problem right now is some kind of like imaginary, you know, middle of the road, cons you know, typically votes Republican guy that they're yelling over in Indiana and not the goddamn president of the United States who and is sitting party. on his ass right now. Right. Like, it's just it's it's ridiculous. This, um, it's anti-democratic, like honestly. This is it's oh, anti-democratic. No, no, no. It's blaming the people for a failure of leadership. It's 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 that like like it's honestly super fucking dangerous because it inflates the the amount of people who think it's bullshit, right? Like it, it adds it acts like Americans aren't two thirds in favor of being way more bold about this shit. I mean, <laughs> Obama is attacking democracy. Obama is doing exactly like with that shit and this entire because this is his fucking attitude, which mm -hmm. is like right before South Carolina too or wherever, whatever I, uh, Virginia. Sorry, like it was. Um, you didn't do enough for me last time, and you saw how that worked out with Trump, right? Like yeah. he is a anti democratic fucking menace. I what a piece of shit this guy. Can I show I you all something? Oof. Can I show you something, Matt? Yeah. Look at that. That's the election results 2008. That's the election results 2008 in the House of Representatives. To sit here and act like the problem is that, like, oh, we haven't had the majorities that we need to do what we need to do, right? Instead of you failed more than a decade ago when there was public awareness and desire to deal with this problem then, right? You failed to have the leadership. And you're talking now, the problem is that the tactics are wrong. Look, you know, we did a long segment, a segment, one of my favorite segments that we ever did with Michael. One of the, my favorite segments I ever worked with, with with Michael was when we criticized some of Extinction Rebel, uh, Rebellion's tactics, when they said, hey, this isn't yeah. working and having the effect that you're having. Uh, we're, I'm not sitting here saying that there is no criticism to make of, of certain kind of tactics. We have people on the show all the time um, who are making the point that, like, you know, people who care about, uh, you know, a livable future need to move past this kind kind of, I don't know, activist uh, mentality of like us against the world and start saying, okay, we need to build labor coalitions. We need to build democratic coalitions. Like we're ready to have that conversation, but you know, who's not going to sit there at the table and have that conversation is the people in damn power who refuse to do it in the first place and are now sitting here acting like the main problem is a bunch of young kids who can, I mean, think about that for a second. You're a young climate activist from, I don't know, the Netherlands or something. And you get to go and see, you know, super cool Barack Obama talk to you about what you need to do and he's telling you right now that you need to lower your expectations and be less active right but also somehow put pressure on governments i mean that's the contradiction but it, truly with it, it obama's message like we need to put pressure on governments right but the only way you can really do that is by voting right i mean he 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 truly you know put him up there with shell executives put him yes. up there with bp executives that is the role that he is playing absolutely um, you know and it's even more cynical to sit here and say i believe in the science i believe in all these things and to sit here and do that give me a say, break say thank you please remember that it, it, uh, made the number one driller in oil say thank you please yeah yeah, yeah remember i mean i frankly I, I might even have that somewhere on this computer i don't want to waste too much time but you know, people after he after he lost to trump what did he spend his time doing he went and was giving dinners to like oil executives and rich people and say thank you say thank you to me um for increasing drilling more than any other person more than w Texas boy, Obama did more for the oil industry than W, and he's going to sit here in 2021 and and talk about what we need to be doing. Give me a break. I mean, we need to get the point is is that while these groups and while these meetings, frankly, um, are are getting more um, conservative 
right? At least in like the, the main events, um, more and more people are getting, um, radical. We're going to go, we have one more disappointing one to get to, but before we get there, actually, there's one, I don't know if you've seen this map, but this is from uh, Bolivia, um, <laughs> which I think is a great response to a lot of the BS that we were seeing. And this is Bolivia's chief negotiator. Um, oh, hell yeah. Diego, uh, Pacheco, Pacheco, I, Belanza, I apologize if I mispronounced your middle name there. Um, but here we go. In an interview with The Guardian, Bolivia's chief negotiator, uh, Diego Pacheco Balenzia, um, criticized rich countries' refusal to discuss loss and damage or compensation at COP26 as evidence of diplomatic bullying, which yep. it 100% is. Loss and yep. damage needs to be a part of these conversations. Um, he said, there has been a systematic attempt by developed countries to remove all discussion about responsibility, compensation, and direct climate finance from the negotiations. And that last one is crucial critical man we need to be talking about the finance this is you know you can make all the pledges that you want we can talk about your heart and we can watch polar bears you know you know struggling falling off of melting ice caps all that you want until you start talking about the money shut the fuck up um it's shameful instead they want us to focus on carbon markets a great way for some people to get rich that's my editorial and their 2050 net um, zero narrative which is completely meaningless the net zero narrative is a big lie we need climate we need to eliminate greenhouse gases now not 30 years i mean that's leadership yes that's talking true and that's something that obama probably wouldn't be too happy with (laughs) yes well i mean (laughs) <laughs> Much better politicians than Obama don't seem to be want to emphasize. And that. it's also higher stakes because Obama is always going to have friends with nice little islands to go and visit. Yeah, you know? exactly. If one but, sinks, they, you know, Richard Branson's got a couple. He, uh, they probably bought all the land up like where the sea lies will rise. It's going to be a new beachfront property already. All right. We have this last clip because I'll tell you what. I think that is worth um, – I, we said this, what, two weeks ago or last week, we were talking about the vote on the infrastructure deal. I have to say, good on AOC for saying no, voting no, right? Mm-hmm. It's an uphill fight. We come at them hard. Um, I, I, you know, There's a lot of politics and things that we're going to talk about in a second that I don't love. But you know, she does do a lot of things that are important, and I'm happy to have her in Congress. I think that you know we can have that role of saying, like, what does this mean for the democratic socialist movement in general? Where do we need to be going? What things do we need to be leaving behind? And also being able to say these are great allies who, for the most part, are on our side, and we're trying to you know put our pressure on our people who are going to listen because Biden and Obama you know aren't receptive at all. So this oh, is you know these are the points that we want to make to people who we think that we're in discourse with and in alignment with on some levels. Anyway, um, I want to give her credit and everyone else who voted no on the infrastructure deal because that was an important uh, move. Um, and that needs to that, that kind of mentality needs to continue because we can't accept this. But this yeah. is just amazing to go from that to this in a week. Is there anything else you wanted to, to say to introduce this? No, the only thing I want to say is like the, the big problem with it is you can't be contradicting the people who are like really elaborate, like the 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 clip or the quote you just suggested, or Greta Thunberg out there yeah. calling this a greenwash affair. You can't be having the left flank um, contradicting that stuff, right? Like the, mm-hmm. that that sort of energy. AOC cannot be like speaking across at cross purposes with that, and that's what she's doing here, and that's why it's so disappointing. And like anyway, I, I agree, yeah. And Greta has been phenomenal, I think, as as one of the most like not, um, notable like climate activists in, in at least in the United States right now. Um, you know, coming out and saying that this is blah blah blah, and like you know, basically putting up two middle fingers at this um, this kind of charade that we've been watching. And I think for this, good, yeah, as you were for saying, for this loss damage thing too, which is like AOC. If you want to make up for this, make us think about loss and damage in some way that like makes it the topic of the day. Like, because like that's what we need to hear from you instead of this america is back at cop at and on the international stage as a leader in climate action and drawdown one thing that i think is so exciting about this time is that when we say that the United States is back, it's not just that we're back in the way that the United States was pursuing climate policy before. It is different. And I would argue that it's a fundamentally different approach. I mean, um, maybe Biden's desire to be seen in a certain way is different than Trump's. 
<laughs> it's a low bar. Um, the kind of the lack of seriousness that we have seen from the proposed Biden plants as they have been chopped up. Um, I think notably um, some of that I've said multiple times now, but it's worth noting that within Biden's um, domestic plans for dealing with climate change, they are heavily reliant still on tax credits, which is an extremely austerity um, driven neoliberal, um, you know, it, it comes from a neoliberal ideology that the market is going to find the solution to these problems, right? And look, I don't sit here and expect that Joe Biden is going to be a radical on these things, which is why he is not equipped for the moment, right? Right. But I'm not going to sit here and say, like, well, well, it's great that America has found a way to give more tax credits to coal companies. That's uh, compounding the error. Year. We talked about this last week, how, you know, there are coal companies that, as um, Build Back Better is written today, there are coal companies that will be profitable for an extra 12 years. This is, you know, the, these, these, um, this has been found by, what is it, the Sierra, um, Sierra Club, right? That essentially, um, you know, by giving all these subsidies to dirty, dirty fuel sources, you're giving them actually a lifeline to continue along into the future. If you want to be throwing money at these, throw money at the workers so that they can have a just transition, not fucking throw money at the people at the top of those systems to continue to allow them and privately owned power companies to continue to pollute the earth. If that's leading the climate crisis to fight against the climate crisis, we are screwed. And yep. I think that, you know, you, you got to know better than this. I understand trying to, you know, be positive in a way to sort of encourage people to continue down this road. But this is not adequate, and it's it's insulting to everybody else who's there um, to sit here and talk like that. That's because um, exactly because she is there in a place where like our friends from La Ruta de Clima cannot be. She's allowed in rooms that they're not. Yeah, and to yeah. talk about and and you can't get. You, that's the thing. It's like, are you representing us at this table? This whole thing about like you want to be represented at the table. Well, when you talk like this, you're not representing anybody from the left at that table. You're representing mm -hmm. something else. And like Godspeed with that. Maybe it's better than like whatever Democrats are doing typically. That's not that's not what anybody is here for. And it's it like it just absolutely like out, that this happened after like like you said like Greta Thunberg who like like has I like as a child. Like I face a similar pressures, frankly, that AOC does, and she's able to get out there. Like, mm -hmm. it, like you can't, you can't be like. She's when Greta says your generation is failing him, and she's looking upward. She's looking mm -hmm. a little bit now. She's looking at a 30, 20, 30 year olds. That's not the same message anymore. See, so you're messing up that message, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, it's not just a generational problem, is it then? If, if we're all of a sudden calling the USA a leader again after doing nothing. And there's another clip, and I just want to address this for people who want to say, like, in this other clip, she said, like, we need to do action. That's what leaders do. Leaders mm -hmm. do the actions, right? Like, and then you get to call them leaders. They're, they're not leaders by theorizing about stuff and about tax credits, right? Like, and just not being Trump anymore. I mean, it's, it's really... It, 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 people made a lot about the gala thing, about the tax rich thing, but, like, at a certain point, you need to know... What tables are you don't need to be at? And yeah, and given everything going on in the world, and the way other people are uh, like reacting to those tables, you don't want to be at that table. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's that's a hundred percent right. And I don't know. I mean, it's 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 a tough moment, and like we definitely need a lot more fire and, and push back against these systems because I mean the clock is is ticking and. Everybody wants to do these pledges now. You're seeing all of these major corporations do these green pledges. And frankly, that's what they are. They're pledges. They're promises that are easily broken because they're quickly forgotten. And um, uh, until we sort of push a different kind of paradigm, a different kind of politics, this is all that we're going to get. I don't know. I don't mind sitting here right now and, and pointing out the hypocrisy of these people who told us this is the most important election of our lifetime and that we need to deliver them power so they could do something and then watch them do nothing or the bare minimum, um, and then open up, uh, you know, opportunities for these same forces to continue uh, polluting the globe. And I think just overall with like the squad project, uh, given what's happened on uh, BBB and, and this stuff, like in AOC particularly, like she's valuable because of a fundraising. We need to start talking about where that money goes. And mm -hmm. if AOC is going to continue sharing it with all the uh, progressive caucus members that bailed on Build Back Better, then people need to That's stop giving point. money to AOC. Yeah.
No, I mean, I think that's, you know, it's, that's serious, but it's, I think it's, it's, it's true. I mean, that's exactly the kind of pressure that needs to be put on them. It's a threat that at least needs to be floated. Uh, Yeah. And no, we have real expectations for this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, all right. So we're going to go to the post game in in a second, but before we go, while we're live, while this is the public feed, we need to talk about uh, Nicaragua. Um, they had an election last Sunday, an election that before it already happened, the United States and its allies were making a big deal and a big stink about it. They were already going to refuse the results of that election before it happened, and we're seeing it again. I'm just going to talk right now, and I, I mean, I'm curious, you know, your thoughts. Jump in wherever you want, Matt. I, I think that it's important that we're honest about um, these these kind of things and that that we're sincere, because I'll tell you one thing right now. It's an easy call on this without getting into the nuance of everything that's going on in Nicaragua, um, everything that's going on uh, politically and within the past decade there. Um, the call, especially for American leftists, is very easy. No to the Biden administration meddling and no to the OAS. That's it. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about that shit. Y'all should know better. Everybody knows exactly what's going on. Now, um, We'll get into maybe some stuff in just a moment. I, I just want to say regarding Ortega um, and the government there, for me, it's not the kind of version of, of, of socialism that I'm trying to, to advocate for. It's not what I've been looking at, particularly as a model. It's a government that has done a lot of good things for folks, but it's also a government that is under siege under siege from the United States government. And you know what happens w- w- with that? That means you're essentially you're in a war state constantly. That does not always create the nicest, sweetest versions of liberal democracy that we might sort of aspire to. Right? I mean, look at what uh, like the freak out about Russian spies did to American democracy in the past four years. <laughs> That's right? true. Like, and we're watching that. I mean, we're, I'm sorry. I'm sitting in a state right now which still disenfranchises people of color and poor people. Right? Um, the point is not to excuse or to turn your head the other way about things is to understand the context in what they happen. So the United States is alleging um, that the that the the results of the election are illegitimate because some of the candidates who are running against Ortega um, have been jailed. I want to note two quick things on that. One, um, you can certainly see where that creates a crisis of you know legitimacy. Right. But let's not forget what the kind the context of this is and that many, not all, but um, there are people who have been arrested, who are presidential candidates, who have been implicated in plots to overthrow the Ortega government. And this is not just hearsay. This has been reported on. Um, this is from uh, the Council on he- Hemispheric, he- Hemispheric Affairs. Let me just read you this first paragraph here. An extraordinary leaked document gives a glimpse of the breadth and complexity of the U.S. government's plan to interfere in Nicaragua's internal affairs up to and after its presidential election in 2021. The plan, a 14-page extract from a much longer document, dates from March to April this year, this was in 2020, and sets the terms for a contract to be awarded by USAID called a Request for Task Order Proposal. It was revealed by reporter William Grigsby uh, from Nicaragua's independent radio La uh, Prima Sima um, and describes the task of creating what the document calls the environment for Nicaragua's transition to democracy, end quote. The aim is to achieve uh, an orderly transition from the current government of Daniel Ortega to a government committed to the rule of law, civil liberties, and a free civil society. The contractor will work with the democracy, human rights, and governance DRG subsectors, which in reality is an um, agglomeration of NGOs, think tanks, media organizations, and so-called human rights bodies that depend on U.S. funding and which while claiming to be independent, are in practice an integral part of the opposition to the Ortega government, right? This is what is being revealed. This is what the playing field is, right? This is not just allegations being thrown around. 
This is the United States having a playbook to work with these countries. We talk all the time about how all, all these, you know, U.S. funded NGOs are very little more than kind of proxy organizations for the United States government that try to overthrow uh, other governments. Right. This is like the fact of what governing in that country is. Right. Is that there are hostile powers that are looking to not just overtake you, but to turn the United States into a continuation. I'm sorry to not to turn yet to turn Nicaragua. Nicaragua um, into a country that is open for American, um, you know, pillaging, right? That is the context of what's going on right now. That doesn't mean that everything that Ortega does is good. That doesn't mean that we can't look at what's happening within the country and have sober eyes on it, right? I'm not going to sit here and tell you my grand pronouncement of who is good and evil, right? Um, you know, like we're sitting at the end of, of, of history here. I'm, but what I want to tell people, especially our American audience, what the playing field is, what the United States is trying to do, and how you need to understand that this does not create an environment for healthy democracy yeah i mean that's the question is like who is the complainant if all of a sudden like you know um different leftist leaders from south america were like hey we got some questions about nicaragua um then i'd take it seriously um but this mm -hmm. idea that the oas is the one that says like hey take a closer look here meanwhile like just like i, I have this article up here this is just from how recently june 7 2020 a bitter election accusations of fraud and now second thoughts a close look at the bolivian election data suggests which is by the way this was available at the time this is just new york times getting to it mm -hmm. later um, a close look at Bolivian election data suggests that initial analysis by the oas that raised questions of vote rigging and helped force out a president was flawed so like Again, like that's like you said, this is a very easy call. This is elementary. The call, the call, like the the situation for sure. I think it's very fair to say the situation for sure, like in the country, is is complicated and tense. The call, as somebody in the United States, is very simple. Yeah. No to Biden. No to the OAS. Um, you know, I mean, maybe we could. It'd be nice to do a, a longer episode on this in the future. You know, there are like I believe Evo um, and and Maduro have have sort of congratulated Ortega. Um, as far as I know, I think that Castillo in, in Peru hasn't as of yet, right? So there's even fracturing there. The point is, is that you know there there are conversations being had, and I think that there's some people who refuse to to pay attention to anything other than just opposing America, which you should be doing, uh, but don't do it in such a way that you're unable to sort of react to the world around you. Yeah. I think that Nick Estes has a, has a good line on this and that might be a good place to close. Um, this is his response, his response to Joe Biden's accusation that the results in uh, Nicaragua were a quote sham. Um, Nick says uh, Biden tries to meddle with Nicaraguan elections by claiming their illegitimacy. His hostile stance on Cuba, Venezuela, and now Nicaragua shows the Democratic president is in some ways more belligerent than Trump as the United States tries to reassert its waning power in the hemisphere. I think that that is uh, a, a correct analysis, and I think that that's why the, the moment is so so uh, dire and we should take it seriously yeah because i think trump uh, was not helpful in the whole guaido stuff um yeah. i think and it, and it is scary to think like maybe that's even even with the it being getting pride of place in the new york times maybe we'll just like amnesia our way into letting the oas uh, uh change the government again yeah well y'all that was uh a really fun episode. I love being able to talk about South Carolina. Um, we're we're going to have a bonus episode uh, later this week up for y'all. We'll announce that very soon. Um, for everybody um, who is new, if you're just joining us for the first time, please consider joining us um, for the post game. We have so much stuff, frankly. Uh, Matt and I had to cut like five stories we wanted to do in the main show. So the post game is going to be jam packed. Um, so please consider joining us at patreon.com slash left reckoning. You get access to the post game, which come up about 20, 30 minutes after this live. We take your questions from that. You also get access to our bonus episodes. We have a long, long uh, at this point, um, back catalog two of bonus episodes that people should be checking out. You get think tanks, you get deep dives into George Orwell, etc. cetera. Uh, so please consider joining us uh, on the other side. Thank you, folks. See y'all soon.